All right, um, let's keep going. We were talking about the basic classifier and its importance in machine learning. This is one of the, if not the most important uh, topic to understand in machine learning um, because that's the best classifier we can theoretically design. So let's get back to the idea. So imagine that we are in a problem where our feature space is just one dimensional. So I'm going to consider, I mean, the real domain R. Um, and I am measuring my feature, my single feature here is measuring something very simplistic. So for example, um, I have a problem in a factory and I have to automatically classify fish, right? And I'm classifying sea bass versus sockeye salmon, right? Something like that. And what I'm going to do, I'm going to take pictures of this. I'm going to compute how the length of the fish, right? And that length is my single variable x, my feature here. And then uh, sockeyes are smaller than sea bass. So say sockeyes maybe take this distribution. Um, let's assume it's a Gaussian. And maybe um, sea bass, which are larger, uh, have a Laplacian distribution that looks like this. And then I can compute using the base classifier that we uh, derived last time in our last lecture. We remember got this a uh, neck of the log likelihood, the negative of the li log likelihood ratio, which is just simply this equation. Now assuming that it is equally probable for me to observe a sea bass than it is to observe a sockeye, then the classifier is going to be right here where the probabilities are the same. And again, I'm assuming the two probabilities are equal. And that's my base classifier right here at the point, let's call it X star. That is the best I can ever do, as we saw, because if I move that classifier left or right in my feature space, the base error, remember the base error is given by this equation here, which is nothing else integrating all this volume area in this case, all this area or volume under these two curves. If I move, say, this classifier over here, then this new area that I'm covering here is added to my equation, to my uh, integral here, which means that I'm actually adding error, not subtracting error. And there is no other classifier is going to give me a, smallest, a smaller error, right? This is the smallest I can ever uh, get. And that's why people, um, a goal, or no goal, but a goal, I should say, a goal of machine learning is to derive algorithms that are base optimal. That's a huge goal of learning. And obviously that is ideal, but we have two problems that we have to contend with, right? We already discussed these two problems in our last lecture. The first one is the problem given by these two underlying distributions here, right? Let's call them um, F1, the PDF of this distribution, and F2, the PDF of this other distribution. The problem with these underlying PDFs is that they are, or distributions rather, uh, is that they are unknown, right? The PDFs are unknown, the distribution is unknown, right? The parameters of the PDF are also unknown. Um, so that's a problem. We not only we do not have the param we don't know the parameters of the distribution, we don't even know what the distribution is, right? Is it the Gaussian, is it Laplacian, is it something else? Um, that's a problem, <laughs> right? So if we knew, know that if we knew that, which is going to be most often the case and not, that we can assume for some reason that the underlying distribution of my data is, say, a Gaussian, right? then we know the parameters of a Gaussian, the mean and the covariance matrix, and we know how to estimate the mean and the covariance matrix with samples, right? So at least I can compute 
an approximation of the underlying distribution. But if I don't even know what the PDF is, uh, then that's where the huge problem uh, arises. And we're going to spend a lot of time discussing this. Um, the other problem is that in this case that I've drawn here, this is very simple, but in a more generic case, let me draw a different example. Let's say that um, I have designed this algorithm for a company and they're not happy with the results because the base error that they have is still pretty large, right? And they want to do better, so I'm going to add a second feature. So I'm going to call the first feature I had x1, the second feature now x2, and the second feature could be the color of the fish, right? And then I may actually have, say, um, two distributions um, that look something like this. Well, actually, let me do two Gaussians because otherwise it's going to be really tough for me. <laughs> um, so I have these two distributions. And what is now the classifier that, the base classifier that gives me these two regions, R1 and R2? It's a nonlinear function that looks something like this, right? So now this is my new base classifier. Now the problem that this gives us is that we have to compute this equation here for the base error, but this is a nonlinear function now, right? And generally integrating over nonlinear functions is complicated. Uh, sometimes you can compute it, but generally you can't. Right? So the problem is um, not only we do not know what the underlying distribution is, we don't, know, we don't even know what the PDF is, but even if we did, in the generic case, we don't know what the base error will be. I cannot tell you what the actual error of a classifier that I've designed, the best classifier I can ever design, I cannot tell you what the error of that classifier is in general. And that's a problem. <laughs> so again, base classifier with normal distributions. Um, we'll talk about other extensions of this. But with normal distributions, there is a particular case for which all this can be solved. And that is for the homostatistic case. Remember, homostatisticity means in the normal distribution, normal distribution is given by a Actually, I'm using i um, by mu i and sigma i, right? So it has two parameters, the normal distribution, the mean, and the covariance matrix. And if I assume that the covariance matrices are all equal to sigma for every class, then that's called homocedastic, right? Homo meaning the same and cadastic variance of the same variance. And when that is the case, we show that that simplifies to a linear equation shown here, right? And what does this mean that we have a linear equation? Well, in our case here, we now have two Gaussian distributions that look like this. They both have the exact same covariance matrix sigma, right? But their means are different. So this would be mu one, this would be mu two, but sigma is the same. And now, if I were to compute the base classifier, this is going to be a hyperplane, a line into D, hyperplane in higher dimensions. Um, and, and this is given by this equation right here. And if you look at this equation, it has two components, right? A vector that defines the norm of that hyperplane. So remember uh, from image processing, when we look at this, right, that there is a normal vector of a plane or a hyperplane that defines the orientation of my plane and the offset of that plane that defines the distance of that hyperplane or that normal to the origin, the coordinate system, right? So that actually is the equation that we'll be using the most throughout the course. This is an ideal equation for us, but it's under a very strong assumption of 
not only normal distributions, but of equal covariances. And we'll have to work around these assumptions and see how we can solve for that. There is a heterosterastic um, derivation uh, or extension of the base classifier, obviously, um, which is this one, which we also derived in our last lecture. But the problem is that this term right here is quadratic, right? And that's what leads us to these nonlinear uh, classifiers. We will work with this uh, if we can, but obviously that's going to give us problems, okay? You will see that um, there's a, a very long literature on that, that since the base error cannot be classified, um, cannot be uh, computed, people sometimes will compute approximations or bounds of that error, right? So usually people will work with bounds, either upper bounds or lower bounds. A very famous one is a Chernoff bound. Which takes advantage of a very um, simple equation that says if I have the minimum of two numbers A and B then this is smaller or equal than a to the power of beta minus one, no, actually beta, times b to the power of one minus beta. And beta here has to be between zero and one, okay? So a and b are positive numbers, and beta has to be larger or equal than zero, and um, small equal than one. So if we use this, um, I'll let you uh, see that this is the case, but it's very easy to prove, right? Um, if we take our probability of the error, right, the base error, that is, remember that this is the minimum, I integrate over the minimum of the prime probability P1 times the posterior P1 of X, or the prime probability of class two, the posterior of class two, DX. And now obviously if I use this equality, uh, I'm going to get, um, I'm going to get, let's, let's assume for now also P1 equal P2 for simplicity. That's going to lead us to simpler equations, and I'll tell you why in a second. Um, you're going to have that the probability of error, if you don't want to assume this for now, then it's actually not too complicated. Let, let me probably give it to you. It's a smaller or equal than P1 to the power of beta, P2 to the power of one minus beta. I integrate over the whole space, the posteriors, small p1 to the power of beta and the small p2, one minus beta, right? Okay, now note that I said now that this error is a smaller or equal than this because this is the inequality that I have over here, okay? Now, for normal distributions, this is obviously just for normal distributions, this equation can actually be calculated, can be derived, and this term right here, that I have right here, this term, is equal to e to the power of negative let's call it um, epsilon or a small e beta. Um, this is a function and this function is equal to, let's see, beta times one minus beta divided by two mu two minus mu one transpose beta sigma one plus 
1 minus beta sigma 2 inverse times mu 1 minus mu 2 plus 1 half the log of beta sigma 1 plus 1 minus beta sigma 2 over sigma 1 to the beta, sigma 2, 1 minus beta. Okay. Now if you substitute the normal distribution here, in this equation right here, that's what you're going to get, right? So you get e to the negative power of this. And now note something very interesting. This term right here that we have, you see this term? You see this term right here? Have we seen this before? That's the equation of a distance that we derived earlier, right? Um, this is actually called the Chernoff distance. It's actually pretty useful. All right. Um, so note that if I have the Chernoff bound for normal distributions, then I can easily compute that because mu1 and mu2 are my estimates, right? So my simple means, so I can compute that. Sigma1 and sigma2 are my means, and I can estimate that. So everything is known except for beta. Now, if you take P1, the prior P1 equal to the prior P2, then the optimal beta you can show is 1 half, 0.5. And then in that case, you can solve um, and get a, an upper bound, right? Note that this indicates right here that the base error is a smaller equal than this. So this is an upper bound, yes. The covariance matrix, you mean? Sigma 1 and sigma 2, these are the covariance matrices of the class 1 and class 2. Right? This is what we said over here somewhere. Where did I say that? Right here, right? The normal distribution is given by the mean and the covariance matrix of each of the classes, right? So. This class here is defined by, or this class by mu1, this class is defined by mu2, this one is defined by sigma1, this one is defined by sigma2. Yeah, I'm just how to compute this, how to compute that log. You, you, you can take the determinant of this, you can take the trace of the matrix, it doesn't matter, it's just a number. It's just gonna give you a relationship of the, what this, what this says, you see these betas here? So what we're going to do, we're gonna take one half for equal covariances where, and then what this is gonna give us, it's just the average covariance matrix of that normalized by the variances and covariances, right? Make sense? All right. Okay, um, there is a simplification of this when sigma one is equal to sigma two, which is called the Batacharya bound, uh, which I'm not going to cover, but just to let you know. And I'm gonna post also in Carmen a paper that defines very tight bounds, okay? They're increasingly close to the true base error. They're very difficult to compute, but um, these things exist, and I want you to know that. Okay, so, um, to repeat myself, this is great, this is what we aspire to, 
but unfortunately we can generally compute this. So how, what are we going to do? How are we going to solve this? So let's start with the error. How are we going to compute the error to begin with? And then we're going to go into deriving classifiers under the homostaticity assumption, okay? So, unfortunately, I cannot compute the base error, so I'm going to do the next best thing I know to how to do, which is to compute the empirical error. And the sample error. So let's start with empirical error. The empirical error, as we discussed last time in our last lecture, is nothing else than a theoretical number. So if I integrate in my space, so remember I have x, this is just what we discussed in our last lecture, which is defined by p dimensions, y, which is defined in q dimensions, and we have simple pairs xi, yi. This is my input, this is my output, and I have n simple pairs, right? And what we want to do, we want to compare the output of our classifier that we're talking about, let's call it G as before, and our oracle function. So this is our oracle function. And we want to differentiate according to the distribution of our data, okay? This is, of course, as we discussed, the same as the expected value, um, where L is the loss function. And we discussed already several loss functions that we could use. We could use the square loss, or the two norm loss, or the two loss, um, which is nothing else than the two norm of the vector a minus b, or you could write it down as um, a minus b square, right? Or a minus b transpose a minus b, right? Um, it would be more appropriate if they are vectors, obviously. If they are numbers, doesn't matter. Um, and this is also called, many times, especially in signal processing, the mean square error, right? Or MSC. Um, this actually uses the true norm, right? So this is the same as if I have, this is uh, my x, right? Whatever I have here, L of x. And this is my output then this computes something like this, right? Okay, I could do it worse. All right, that's a little better. So this is x squared, right? But I could also use any other norm. I could use the one norm, for example, we said, um, which is uh, going to give me the mean absolute error, mean absolute error, which is the loss of A is given by, um, actually, why don't I do AB to be consistent with this? AB is equal to 1 over N, the sum from 1 through N of A minus B absolute value, right? And this absolute value defines the one norm. And obviously, in general, I could use the P norm here, or the, well, I'm already using P, so the K norm, right? Um, 
for computing the loss. And we'll, yes. No, the oracle function is a function. It's a true function that you're looking for, right? It's an unknown function that you would like to approximate. The oracle function, given an input x, tells you what the output should be. The ex uh, that should be, uh, maybe the result will be one with probability for something, with a result will be zero with probability. If if our outcome has to be a probability, then yes, it will be a probability function. But if our outcome is a categorical uh, output, then it will be a categorical function, right, and so on. It depends on what type of output you are uh, estimating. But the oracle function is the function we wish we had. If we had the oracle function, then we're done. <laughs> we wouldn't be here, right? But obviously, the Oracle function is not given to us. It will never be known. Um, um, and we can only hope to sort of approximate in certain condition, under certain conditions or hypothesis what it, this function looks like. That's why it's called Oracle, right? Because it is the Oracle, but <laughs> we, don't, we don't have access to it. G is our classifier. Well, the, uh, or will not give you a probabilistic model. You will. The result will be one with probabilistic. As I said, it can be a probabilistic function, which is what we've been doing with probabilistic models. It gives you a probability. It can be a categorizer, which gives you a, a natural number of one, two, three, four, five, up to whatever number you decide. So let's say C, C the number of categories that you have, right? Or it could be a continuous number, which is when we get to this, this is called regression. Okay, and there are even other possibilities. Okay. Um, so we have, um, these, uh, these two here, um, another one that we discuss is the zero one loss, which is given by LAB. It's equal to this function of A, actually, let me do it like this a different than b, where this function, this function right here, for an entry x is given or it's defined as taking the value 1 if x is true and 0 otherwise. Come. And we discuss one more, which is called the hinge loss. Which we will see, especially in support vector machines, we will discuss this when we get there, which is for uh, a given A, I will output the maximum between 0, 1, minus Ya where y it's our uh, h of a. So let me, why don't I just say our oracle function, right? Or if we want to be consistent, hold on. If we want to be consistent with our previous notation here, let's do L, L of a, b, and then b, a, okay? Right here. That makes more sense. So this is, um, these are the most typical ones. There is another typical one that is used specifically when the output is probabilistic, when your outputs are probabilities. It is common to use the cross entropy loss.
And this one is defined as, um, again, this is for probabilities. Obviously, probability has to be given between 0 and 1. Otherwise, this loss has no meaning. Um, and this is given by the negative of y times the log of p plus 1 minus y, the log of 1 minus p. Okay. So the probability p that I have that can be between 0 and 1, and I multiply this with my y, or 1 minus y for the 1 minus the probability, which is the other probability for the other class, right? So the cross entropy, this one, this function, increases as the predicted probability diverges from the actual Oracle function H, right? So in other words, we are computing the probability of my Oracle function H, right? Or over my function H. I forgot to say, uh, we actually did see another one, right? Another loss, which is um, the log of the cos h, which is something between the two norm and the one norm. But again, you know, the log of the cos h or the p norm here, you can come up with a variety of norms. You can also use um, what's called quasi-norms, okay? So here, um, for the, the loss of x, you could compute the p norm, or again, I'm already using p, so let's do the k norm, okay, of x, where obviously k has to be larger or equal than 1, well, actually it has to be 1, 2, so on, typically, but okay, let's just say in general, larger or equal than 1. But in some cases, in some instances, you may actually want it to have it between 0 and 1. And in that case, when you have k between 0 and 1, this does not define a norm anymore, but defines something that's called a quasi-norm. Okay? And a quasi-norm follows or um, complies with all the properties of a norm. Remember, the properties of a norm, a norm has to always be positive, right? Uh, or not negative. Uh, it has to be symmetric, and it has to abide by the triangular inequality, right? Quasi-norms uh, hold on every single property except for the triangular inequality, which is still given, but up to a scalar, okay? So it holds, that inequality holds if you multiply the right-hand side by a scalar, right? And those are called quasi-norms. And sometimes they're very useful for some applications, worth to, to know that. All right, um, so this is the empirical error. Now, the, if I want to compute the, my simple error with, my, with the samples I am given, then I am going to compute my Rn, I'm going to call it. So the same that I have over there, the R function, but R sub N to indicate that now I'm using N samples, okay?
Now remember what we discussed in the first lecture, right? This is my true estimator. That's what I would like to get, right? Like the mean. I would like to know the mean of my samples. That's impossible. I, I can never know the mean, right? What I can compute is the sample mean, right? That's the same thing. This is the empirical error. Yeah, sure, if I had an infinite number of observations, all the observations in that problem, then I would know what this looks like, but I can't, right? So what I'm gonna do instead, I'm gonna do the best next thing, which is compute the sample error. So if I'm gonna use n samples, I'm going to call this R sub n, and now know that this is no longer an integration because I'm not integrated throughout the space because I could do that even without an infinite number of samples, right? How could I do that even without a, an infinite number of samples? By knowing what else? The underlying distribution, right? I mean, if I did know the underlying distributions and functions, then obviously I could compute this, but I don't. But in reality, what I'm going to do is I'm going to convert this integration, which is nothing else than summing over the whole space at differentials, right? Uh, but summing over samples now, very discrete case. Um, the loss function, I'm gonna use one of these loss functions of my samples xi's. Um, I'm gonna indicate that this g function, my classifier, uh, has an input xi, my sample, and some parameters, wherever these parameters may be, and my oracle function, right? So given my sample, the oracle function returns the true output that I wish to have. So that, um, empirical or sample error, it's also called the risk. And now what we're interested is, our big question is how good is our sample error? And obviously, that's a fundamental question, and it can be actually computed in theory, right? I can compute, say, the gap between the true error, the true empirical error, and the simple empirical error. Okay. So this, typically, it's called the expected error. Right? This is what is expected, and this is what's typically called the empirical. Or sample error. Because what you see in practice, right? Yep. Okay, the expected error, right? Um, is unknown, so we're still facing a huge problem. Now, this one here, this one we do know, right? This one is this one here, so this one we can actually compute, but this one, the expected error is still problematic for us because we cannot integrate throughout the whole space without knowing the underlying distribution. So what we're going to do in practice is we're going to take our n samples that we have over here and we're going to subdivide these n samples into three groups, okay? All right, so partition your samples uh, into three groups. One we're going to call the training set. Let me say, I don't know, XTR, for example. 
the second one is going to be the verification set. Let's call this XV or VR. And a third one, which we're going to call the testing set. XTR or T. TR doesn't make any sense, does it? Okay. Okay. So far, so good. Now we, we still have to decide how we're going to create that subdivision, but bear with me, right? We somehow going to subdivide the end samples into three subsets, right? So I start with a big set X, and now I subdivided it into three subsets. X um, TR, X VR, and X T. Okay. Now, I want to estimate this gap, right, between the expected error and the empirical error. And one way to do that is to compute the expected or estimate the expected error with the verification set and then estimate the empirical error with the testing set. Okay, so let's see how this is going to work out. Imagine that our function g that we're trying to estimate, right? So I have my function g that has as input the feature vectors and some parameters, let's call this theta, okay? Let's assume that there's just one parameter, okay? That's a parameter of my function. Now, if we derive the base classifier with normal distributions, I had two parameters, right? The mean and the covariance matrix, right? And in fact, the number of parameters is usually computed as the number of dimensions of the mean or number of entries in the vector of the mean and the number of entries in the matrix of the covariance matrix, right? So if P is my dimensionality, I had P for the mean and P squared for the covariance matrix, so I'd have P plus P squared, right? That's the number of parameters I would have, right? Let's simplify this to just one parameter. So I have theta here as my parameter, and now here I have my empirical error, okay? And remember, in both cases, I'm trying to compute the empirical error or the sample error of the, um, of the expected error, right? And the one of the true one, uh, uh, excuse me, which is a true one, or the empirical error of the samples. Okay, so let's see how this works. What I'm going to do, I'm going to train my classifier with my training set, right? So I'm going to take this classifier, say the base classifier, and with this data, if I was using the base classifier with no normal distributions, this data is going to be used to compute the mean and the covariance matrix, right, of each class, right? Okay. So that I can do, and I can see that when I change the parameters of my, uh, of my classifier, right, the error, if 
function changes, right? It will take some different values right here, okay? Now that happens with my training error. In general, we will design algorithms, obviously, that look something like this. So as we modify our parameter, the empirical error decreases. And the way we're going to do that, as we have seen, is either with linear least squares or nonlinear least squares, right? Optimization algorithms to try to find the, the parameter that best uh, or minimizes our um, uh, expected error, okay? So for example, in the base classifier, we could use more and more samples to estimate the mean and more and more samples to estimate the covariance matrix. And you would see that this error is going to decrease because you're gonna get better and better and better, right? Okay, so how are you going to estimate this? You're going to estimate this with the verification set that we have here, right? So what you're going to do is you're going to estimate, say, the mean and the covariance matrix with the training, uh, the training set, XTR, right? So this is going to give you two estimates. And then test with the verification set, right? Test these values using the verification set. And then you can see that the more training data that you add, the less and less error that you're going to have in the verification set, right? And for other algorithms that we will design, this will be typically the case, right? It's not always convex like this and nice, but we'll work, we'll work with that at its due time. So that gives you one of the empirical errors that you want to compute. And now what do you want to do? you want to compute the empirical error with the testing set, right? And ideally, you want this to follow this function as well, right? But in reality, this is what's gonna happen. At some point, this is going to deviate, right? And then this gap that we have defined, remember, the gap here, will vary depending on the parameter theta. Right? You see this? And the question is, how can we find a point where this gap is as small as possible using this technique? Okay. So let's see how we can do that. There are a variety of methods to do that. I'm only gonna cover one today, and then much later in the course, we're gonna cover in detail many more statistical methods to, to compute these things. Um, when we talk about uh, the uh, statistics of, uh, of our results and of the statistical significance of our results. So let's see how we can do this. We're gonna use a technique called cross-validation to obtain this result, to, or to use that, um, those observations that we've made there. So the, the problem was, remember, we start with a set of samples, x1 through xn, and I want to divide this into a number of partitions. The first thing that we're going to do, we're going to do, uh, we're going to use an approach that's called k-fold cross-validation. Which subdivides my 
training set into k subsets. So let's say k1 through k, uh, x1 through xk, x1 we can say x11 through x1 n over k, and xk1 through xk n over k. So what I did here is I subdivided, I took chunks of this x, but in such a way that every subset has the exact same number of samples, right? n over k. Right? All right, so I've, I have subdivided this. Now, once, so this would be my first step. My second step, once I have subdivided this, I'm going to use k, right? I have k subsets. I'm, I'm going to use k minus l subsets to train the classifier. So as training samples. Right? This is my training data, k, k minus L subsets. And then I'm going to use, of these L subsets that I have left, I'm going to use L minus M subsets as my verification data. And finally, I'm going to use my last M subsets as my training data. I'm sorry, training, testing, my testing data. Okay. Now, in general, you could, obviously you can have K equal to whatever value you want L to whatever value and M to whatever value. Typically, L and M are taken equal to one. Typically, okay, this is, this is quite typical, but obviously it's not the only solution, right? You can use whatever numbers you want, but that's the most typical case. In, what, in which case, I first subdivide my training data or my samples into K boxes or subsets, I take k minus 2, right? And I train my classifier. I use 1 to very to as a verification set and then 1 as testing. Okay? Now we will see that the reason when we when we put this in practice that the reason people use 1 and 1 for L and M is because of the combinatorics of this approach. So, so far so good. This seems very nice, right? But obviously, if I have to select K minus L elements for training, then I'm going to, I'm sorry, this would be, I'm just noticing this, right? L minus M, right? Okay. So if I'm if I'm taking this k minus l minus m subset for training, there are multiple ways of selecting k minus two, say, right? Right. Um, so which ones are you going to select? Well, what you need to do is you try all the possible selections and then compute the mean and the standard deviation right, of that error that you obtain. But of course, you have to consider M and L as separate sets as well. So here's what usually you would usually do. You divide this into K subsets, take K minus one for training, okay? Leave that last subset out, okay? And now you have K ways of doing that, right? You can leave K different subsets out for testing. And in that case, you have to repeat these K times. But now for each of these K times, there are K minus one ways 
of leaving one set for verification, right? So now we're talking about k minus one times k. Uh, grows pretty fast, <laughs> right? Um, and that's just with l and m equal to one. So you can imagine if you start playing with this, it can get really um, comp uh, computationally expensive. But that's the most typical um, case. Typical values for k are 5, 10, and so on. Um, 5, 10 are pretty common. Um, depending on the size k, obviously it's going to depend on the size of your training data. There are simplifications of this. Uh, you can leave a certain number of samples out. This would be called the leave p or k, let's keep the value k, leave k sample out cross-validation. So this would be another approach. Leave k samples out cross-validation. And in that case, what you do is from your set, k1 through x1 through xk minus, uh, okay, no, xn minus k minus one, right? And xn minus k and then xn, right? You're going to take the last k as your testing data. Right? Okay. And then from this set, you have to further subdivide it into the training and the verification. Okay? The simplest of these approaches of leave k samples out is the obviously leave one sample out cross validation in which case k is equal to one, right? So you just leave one sample out. Now, if you have n samples, you have to repeat this n times and then compute the mean and the standard deviation to give you the final result of your empirical error, right? If you have 100 samples, you see s pi. If you have 10 million samples, it can take a while, right? Um, so leave one sample out. It's <coughs> pretty simple in nature, but it's computationally expensive. And it has another problem, which leads to very optimistic results. You may think that you're doing really well, um, but you're probably doing much worse than you think. And the reason is you're just only testing over one sample, really. And that's less than ideal, right? So when you do your projects, right, I said you could use leave one sample out, uh, but you could also use k samples out, you could use cross-validation, uh, tenfold cross-validation, fivefold cross-validation, and so on. So all these methods allow you to see how your empirical error on the verification set diverges from the empirical error on your testing set, right? And then that gap tells you how well you are estimating your underlying error of your classifier, right? So we will we'll get to that in its due course like weeks from now. Uh, once we have much more knowledge, and we'll see all this in a much more formal way, and we'll see then that the problem with this gap is that is something that's called overfitting to the data. Okay, so we'll get to that. All right. Um, So let's change gears. Let's go back to the base classifier as promised. Now that we have, so this is what we're going to use as a substitution of the base error, right? 
Now let's go back to the base classifier and see how we can use the base classifier based on what we know thus far. Any questions before I raise this? Yeah? So we have the base error and we have the empirical error, right? So in what case the empirical error, or do we know in what case the empirical error would approximate better the base error? Very good question. The question is, d can we know if in some cases under some conditions or when some hypotheses hold, the empirical error is going to be equal to the base error. We're going to talk about this in a few minutes. Yeah? I mean, that's the holy grail. The holy grail of machine learning is to design algorithms that you can prove, theoretically prove, mathematically, that under some conditions, your classifier will give you the base error. Even if you cannot compute that base error, you know that that classifier will give you the base error under some conditions, right? Now, these conditions will not typically hold, but at least you know that in the idealistic case where they do hold, that you're getting the best classifier you can ever design. That's the goal. Does this mean that there are classifiers that will never get to that base error? So this is, the, this is what you're saying? Well, all you, so we're going to try to define classifiers that get as the base error under some conditions, right? So for example, the classical condition that we're going to start with is that the underlying distributions of my data of every class are all Gaussians and that they are homosedastic Gaussians, meaning that the covariance matrices are the same. Under these conditions, we're going to prove that the empirical error that you obtain is the smallest possible, meaning that's the base error cannot be you, you equaling the base error. Okay? Um, but in some instances, we'll get to designing classifiers where we are not able to prove that. We probably don't even want to prove that. We're just hoping for some other that we're hoping that some other criterion that we are using is giving us a result that is useful to us. And then later in the course, toward the end of the course, we're actually going to show that in theory, all this is um, in shallow, uh, it, it, it's, it's, it's difficult to interpret because we're going to prove theoretically that no classifier can ever be better than any other classifier. Um, we'll get there. Okay. And that's where the empirical error will come back and the expected error. And we're going to show, remember what I said about the, um, the square loss. The square loss, it's the second moment of the error and therefore it can be subdivided into the mean and the variance of the error, right? And that's called the uh, mean various, <coughs> excuse me, mean variance uh, dichotomy or separation of the error. And it's very important, it's fundamental terminology to understand your classifier. Because for a fixed error, even if I fix my error, right, with the, L, with the squared loss, even if my error is fixed to a certain number, say my error is x, right, and that's fixed. I can design different classifiers that gives me the exact same x error, but the error either comes from the mean or from the variance or from both. And there are strong implications on what that means, right? We're just getting started. All right. Um, this is called what we're going to cover now, which is how to design the base classifier for normal distributions. It's called discriminant analysis. Uh oh. Okay. I'm out.
So remember that we have our equation that I've erased by the equation that we derived in our last lecture for the base classifier, which is something like this. I want to find the argument i that minimizes this equation. And this equation was, whoops. where this equation is equal to x minus mu i for normal distributions, of course. Transpose, so um, I'm going to assume normal distributions, okay? Uh, sigma i inverse, x minus mu i, plus the log of sigma i minus two times the log of pi, okay? That's what we have derived. This is nothing else than our base classifier, correct? Yep. Okay. Now, um, let's uh, start with the most simplistic case which is the homocedastic case in which we assume that all sigma i's are equal to some sigma for every class, right? Yep. Okay, let's start with this one and see what happens. Because obviously, remember that in the generic case, right, that we have here, this is a quadratic equation, right? We have a quadratic equation. But if we substituted the base classifier with this, we obtain a hyperplane defined by the normal, right? And the offset of uh, that normal, right? So let's see what that means. Imagine that I start with these two homocedastic Gaussians, okay? With different means, mu one, mu two, okay? That meant, remember that the base classifier was a hyperplane, right? But let's see why this is the case, right? To see that, let's whiten, I'm gonna whiten my covariance matrix, right? So I want the covariance matrix to be equal to one. We know how to do that, right? With PCA. So what I'm going to do, or I can buy the composition, I'm going to whiten the space, or the uh, covariance matrices rather, so that they are equal to the identity matrix, right? So now they're still equal, obviously, because they're both the identity matrix, and mu one and mu two are here. Okay. And what is the base classifier? The same place as before is the one where the probabilities are the same, right? Yes? Following thus far? Okay, good. Now, note what happened. You see the vector that connects mu1 and mu2? It's orthogonal to that hyperplane. Isn't that weird, right? So that vector, right, mu1 minus mu2 here, this vector mu1 minus mu2 is orthogonal to my base classifier. I have to multiply this by the whitening step, right, which is the inverse of my sigma, right? Because obviously, originally I'm here. So I whiten the data, which means I invert sigma, and then I compute this. And now I have a vector, let's call it W as before, which can be proportional to this, right? And that vector defines what? That vector defines the normal of that hyperplane, 
right? Yeah? All right. Now, let's see what the base error is in this case. The base error is that area or volume in more dimensions right here, right? The volume in here, that's my base error, correct? Excellent. I mean, obviously, that goes to infinity, but you get the idea, right? Get the gist. <laughs> OK. Um, if I move that base classifier, right, that I have here in dash lines, I increase the error, correct? So that's the best classifier I can ever design. This is the smallest error I can ever have. Now, let's see what happens if I project this two distributions onto that vector that I just defined here, which is given by mu1 minus mu2, right? What happens is that this distribution now is going to look like this, correct? And this one is going to look like this. Oops. See this? And the base classifier is still the exact same thing, right? So let me draw this here, maybe. Now I started with this two. I have computed the vector that connects the two means. I have moved it here to make it clear. And this is orthogonal to my base classifier, OK? And now this distribution projected here will look something like this. And this distribution projected here will look something like this, right? And now the error that I have here, right, in this area comes from this error right here. You see that? Now, if I compute my empirical error right here and my empirical error right here, they're one and the same. You agree? Because see that, if I have a point here that is misclassified, it will also be misclassified here, right? But if the point here is correctly classified because it's drawn from this Gaussian distribution, then it will be correctly classified here as well. And the same happens here, right? Any point here is correctly classified. Any point here that is incorrectly classified is also incorrectly classified. I'm not classifying vectors that I was misclassifying in the two-dimensional space. I'm not classifying vectors in 2D better or worse than I'm classifying it in 1D. Yes, question? Well, but this only happens because you're orthogonal to exactly where this Exactly is. orthogonal because this, this vector here that connects the two means is always orthogonal by definition to the base classifier, right? By definition, under the homostaticity assumption, obviously, right? But that's fascinating. This is, this is incredible. Let's, let's look at this a little more. Now, remember, this is proportional because my basis vector that I'm defining, so this space has to be defined by a basis vector, and that basis vector has to have norm 1, right? So to give the vector in norm 1, I only need to divide by its norm, right? So this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to compute my vector v as we did with PCA, but now for this new discriminant analysis method, which is sigma inverse times mu1 mu2 divided by the two norm of sigma inverse mu1 minus mu2. Okay? And that's a two norm. So if you want, you can add two. Right? So now it's a vector of norm one, so that's a basis vector that defines my space. Now, if I can find my notes. Oh, here it is. Now, I'm going to state the result in a theorem of what we just did. And seriously, to me, 
after that many years working in pattern recognition machine learning, I have to say this is one of the most impressive theorems I've ever seen. Okay? And it's due to Ronald Fisher, a famous statistician that's the father of modern statistics. Okay. Of course, Fisher himself did not write the theorem as I'm going to write it here. Is you know what I've been saying about all these famous statisticians, mathematicians that we think they are uh, incredible geniuses because they come up with things that we're still driving here today. But the uh, basic ideas come from him. So um, I'm going to say that let the simples of two classes, right? My classes could be the sea bass and the sockeye salmon that I had before, right? Let these uh, samples of the two classes be normally distributed. In RP, the real domain of P dimensions, we have common covariance matrix. Actually, why don't I just say with common covariance matrix like this? Okay, actually, we are thus far, um, this is incorrect. I should say. Uh, I equals to one or two because I only have two classes, right? So I only have two classes. Then the empirical error in the original p-dimensional feature space, right? In our RP, our original feature space of p-dimensions, is the same as the empirical error in the subspace defined by this vector v. Okay. Now, let me repeat what I just said in an example because this is almost impossible to believe. If RP is of P equal to 10 million, that means 10 million features in my original feature space, the empirical error that I'm going to compute in 10 million dimensions is going to be exactly the same empirical error I'm going to have in just one dimension, in the feature space of one dimension. That's insane. <laughs> <laughs> this, is, this has to be one of the, if not the best results you've ever heard. Uh, it could be 100 million, it could be 1 billion, it could be a gazillion, it doesn't matter. P can be as large as you want. You can always, always reduce your feature space to just one single feature and still get the exact same accuracy in classification accuracy, right? that you were obtaining in the original space. Mind-blowing, right? <laughs> now, of course, we have made two assumptions, two very strong assumptions, right? One is the covariances are the same, meaning homostatistic distributions, and the other one is I only have two classes, okay? Now, we need to generalize this, and that's what's going to get back to the discussion we we're having earlier about base accuracy or base uh, optimality, we know that this algorithm is base optimal 
under these conditions. Under the condition that I only have two classes and that both classes are normally distributed with identical covariances. Under these conditions, then that algorithm is going to give me the base classifier. It's going to give me the, it's going to be associated to the base error, right? But what happens when these conditions don't hold? Well, now what we're going to do is we're going to extend this such that it works when these conditions do not hold, right? And that's what we're going to typically do in machine learning. We're going to define algorithms that are optimal under some very important criteria, and then we're going to relax the conditions and make it sort of work under other more realistic conditions, okay? Because it's difficult enough to think that your, your data is drawn from, your, uh, the data of each class is drawn from a Gaussian distribution. That's a strong assumption. But to assume that the covariances are the same, that's much stronger assumption, okay? All right. I'll see you next time.